Hello, friends. Welcome to Unpacking the Mass. My name is Keith Nestor, and I will be leading us today through the readings for the second Sunday in Advent. It's good to be with all of you today. I'm thankful that you're here and that we have this opportunity to study the Word of God. Before we begin in our study, let's come before the Lord in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant us in the same spirit to be truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, this is a great uh, opportunity to look at the idea of what it means to come home. And I think that's what the theme of the readings this week is. It's it's the idea that we are separated from God and there are at times some pretty big barriers to our relationship with God. But yet in the season of Advent, we are looking toward the coming of Christ who as we'll see in our readings, lays waste to the mountains. And that's an idea of those things that get in the way, those things that prevent us from coming in to that relationship with Jesus and being reconciled to him. This is a work of God, my friends. And in the readings that we'll see, we are encouraged to have hope and have confidence. So let's jump in to our first reading. It's a great reading. It comes from the Old Testament book of Baruch, uh, chapter five, verses one through nine. Jerusalem, take off your robe of mourning and misery. Put on the splendor of glory from God forever. Wrapped in the cloak of justice from God, bear on the on your head the mitre that displays the glory of the eternal name. For God will show all the earth your splendor, and you will be named by God forever. The peace of justice, the glory of God's worship. Man, if I was in a Baptist church right now and preach, someone would say, preach it. That'll preach. That's amazing stuff that we're seeing right there. Let's continue. I'm fired up already. Up Jerusalem, stand upon the heights. Look to the east and see your children gathered from the east and the west. At the, at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that they are remembered by God. Led away on foot by their enemies, they left you, but God will bring them back to you. Born aloft in glory as on royal thrones. For God has commanded that every lofty mountain be made low and that every and that the age old depths and gorges be filled to level ground, that Israel may advance secure in the glory of God. The forests and every fragrant kind of tree have overshadowed Israel at God's command. For God is leading Israel in joy by the light of his glory with his mercy and justice for company. Boom. That is some heavy duty awesomeness right there, my friend. I mean, think about what that says. Think about what that means, that God is basically telling the people of Jerusalem who have been mourning and weeping and suffering, exile, they, they are lamenting their state in life. And God says to them, take off this robe of mourning and misery. Now, when he says mourning, not like the morning time, but like grieving. You know, there's a time to recognize the the depth of your separation from God and kind of look at your life and go, woe is me when I've wandered away from God. There, there's, a, there's a time for that, obviously. But there's a time also when you're supposed to just take that stuff off and come home. Take that stuff off and come back to God. And that's the work of God, my friends. You're supposed to put on the splendor of glory of God forever. And this is an incredible uh, word of encouragement that God is saying, look, the time for separation is over. And now my work is to bring you back. That is ultimately, my friends, a picture of what Advent is all about, isn't it? Advent is all about the work that God is doing through Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel to bring humanity back unto himself, that reconciliation, because we cannot do it ourselves, my friends. And the imagery here of, of, of a mountain being laid low and a valley being, being filled in, that's beautiful imagery. Of course, we see that um, later on in our, in our other readings, but that's a picture 
of the things that get in the way, isn't it, my friends? That's a, that's a picture of that. And I think that we need to always be mindful in our lives of those times when we have put those obstacles between ourselves and God. We have to be careful about that, but recognize ultimately that God's desire, God's plan is to bring us back. And we'll, of course, see more about this. But setting up this this idea with this Old Testament reading is is huge because, you know, all we have to do is look at the history of the people of Israel who, due to their uh, rebellion and disobedience, were subject to exile, to separation. They were subject to punishment. They were subject to all sorts of things because they hadn't obeyed the word of God. But yet, even in their unfaithfulness, here's the promise of God, my friends. God is faithful. And I love how he says this, that he has given them a name. He's given them a name. You will be named by God forever. And that's a powerful thing. God's promise doesn't fall away. God is faithful, and he has given his people a name. Which What does a name signify? Especially in the ancient world, a name signifies your identity from the standpoint of to whom you belong. You And when you have that name, that's a powerful thing. And, and God is saying that you will be named by God forever. And when God names you forever, there's nothing that can take you away. As Jesus said, there is no nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Okay. Now, this isn't a talk about eternal security and all that kind of stuff, although I believe that that we don't have to worry if, as long as we stay in the hand of Jesus, no one's going to snatch us out. Now we can take ourselves out of that, of course, because God gives us free will, but we don't have to worry, my friends, that if we stay within the fold of the hand of Christ and his church, that someone is going to come against the will of God and take us away, friends. No, we, we have been named by God forever. And in him, if we, as he, as Jesus said, the, who, he who perseveres to the end will be saved. If we do that, then we can have confidence and assurance that we will be with the Lord forever. Okay, let's look at our responsorial psalm. And this, of course, ties right into this. This is from Psalm 126. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Hey, Advent is about joy. Absolutely. I know it's a penitential season. I know it's it's a reflective season as well, but it's also one of joy. We don't have to, those things are not mutually exclusive, by the way. When the Lord brought back the captives of Zion, we were like men dreaming. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with rejoicing. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad indeed. Hey, friends, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you should be full of joy. When, when you come into that place, and maybe you've you've been there, when you've been far from God, and maybe and you had a chance to go to confession and you were able to to receive absolution from your priest and you were reconciled to God in that ministry of reconciliation that St Paul talks about you were reconciled to God through that sacrament you should be filled with joy and i know that's like an experience a lot of us have but sometimes we have to be reminded of that that's a joyful thing we have to remember what it is that has happened we have been we've been brought back out of captivity to our sin and our mouths should be filled with laughter, our tongue with rejoicing. We need to be sharing the joy and the powerful faith of what it means to be brought back to God. We should be telling the whole world about this. We should be like, Hey, I once was lost, but now I'm found. We need to share that testimony, that story of how God has brought us back to himself. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the torrents in the southern desert. Those who weep in tears, those who sow in tears shall reap rejoicing. You know, um, I think it's in the book of Joel. I could be wrong. Um, There's a a text that talk about God restoring the lost years. And maybe you're a person who lived part of your life, maybe a significant part of your life, away from God. Or you've made bad decisions that have had bad consequences in your life and things have been messed up. You know, I can relate to that. And I can tell you that when God restores us, right, when we have come to this place of restoration with God, it isn't just this decree that God says, yep, you're good. The work of the Spirit of God in your life 
can have this element of restoration to you where God makes things even better than they could have been before. And I know that might seem difficult. And I know that in some instances we, 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 we struggle with that. You know, for instance, if, if, if someone passes away or, or whatever, you know, that person doesn't come back to life, but the overall arching principle of God restoring our fortunes. I, I know this to be true in our lives, my friend. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about like financial fortunes. I'm talking about how God can take a person who is completely and utterly broken and God can bring them to a place of restoration where it's beyond anything they could have ever imagined. It's beyond anything they could, they could, you know, and I, I think about people, you know, you think about the prodigal son. This is a great example of this. And it fits with the readings of coming home. The prodigal son not only got to come back home, but he was expecting and hoping really to come home and be a servant of the father, but he was welcomed back as a son. He was given a ring, which is also a symbol of identity. He was given a robe. He was given a feast. He was given back really his standing as a son. That's a level of restoration, my friends, that we have to understand. And I know it's not just about a worldly restoration, because like I've said, there can be elements of this where things can never go back to the way they were. And that can be hard sometimes, you know, um, I, you know, I went through a, a, a really hard season of my life where, um, you know, things changed for me. And while I could never experience things the way before, like, I, you know, whatever, God can sometimes make things even better. But there are other times where uh, they can't be physically better than the way they were. Maybe you were, maybe your arm was chopped off in an accident or something like that. Or maybe, like I said, maybe you have a loved one that passed away and you might say, well, okay, well, I can't be restored with that person, but what does it mean? You know, God has a way of bringing comfort and healing and restoration into us that goes beyond our, our human experiences and can give us comfort and hope for the, the time when we will be completely made whole in his eternity. But that doesn't mean that we have to just sit back and wait until we die before God restores us. No, friends, this is the work of God. He knits our hearts together in his, in his love and in his mercy. And if we sow in tears, we will reap rejoicing. We can rejoice even when things are rough because we have this hope. Because why? As we have said here, the Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Although they go forth weeping, carrying seed to be sown, they shall come back rejoicing, carrying their sheaves. The Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. You know, I think of the text because I'm in my mind right now. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, about death and loss. Because I know that that that's something that we go through, something I've gone through. And I think to myself, you know, yeah, I will never experience a, a worldly reunion with my mother who passed away uh, almost four years ago. You know, I'm, I'm not going to experience that on this earth. But I have hope that, as St. Paul says, that death, where is thy sting? That's a, that's a future hope that there will be a heavenly reunion with her. Cause she loved Jesus like with every, every ounce of her being. And I believe in my heart that God will give that restoration that he's given comfort to me. Even in the darkness of that loss, there's this hopeful uh, sense of joy and peace because I know that she's with Jesus. And I know that someday Lord willing, we will be reunited, but that doesn't mean that until that moment, I can't experience his consolation. No, friends, that future hope, that rejoicing is something that, that I've experienced. And, and I want to encourage you in that right now, because there are some things in this life, when it comes to this idea of restoration, there are some things that God can do in this life. And there are some things that God waits to do until uh, we pass into eternity. And, and that's okay. We have to recognize that in, in God's, in God's providence, he has allowed those things to happen. And yet in the midst of it, we can find joy. But really, this ultimately is about have we allowed ourselves to be brought back to him? Because let's face it, sometimes 
we'll we'll find these mountains in our lives that keep us away and and it can be our grief it can be our loss it can be our our anger and our our lack of understanding we can say god i don't get why this has happened i don't understand this and and that can feel like an immovable mountain to your faith can it sometimes my friends and what god wants to do is just say look i'm going to take that and destroy it i'm going to level it down so that there can be uh rejoicing and reconciliation my friends let's look at our text from philippians from our epistle here this is good stuff for saint paul writes to us in philippians chapter one starting in verse four and ending in verse 11 uh, we go four through six and eight and eleven he says brothers and sisters i pray always with joy in my every prayer for all of you because of your partnership with the gospel from the first day until now i am confident of this this is huge guys that the one who began a good work in you will continue to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may increase ever more and more in knowledge and every kind of perception to discern what is of value, so that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. So much there. I, I want to hone in on one particular area um, right here first. If, if we want to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, okay, which is our goal, that's what we want, okay? And that's St. That's Paul's prayer, his intercessory prayer for the church in Philippi. He's praying, this is my prayer for them. I'm interceding on their behalf, okay? He says this, you got to increase in love and in knowledge of every kind of perception. Why? So you can discern what is of value. Okay, if you want to be pure and blameless, you have to be able to understand what's really important, what's really of value. That's the key to this whole thing, my friends. And the way that you do that is, is with the affection and love of Jesus Christ. Because when you love God more, and this is the key, right? It's not about, hey, do this, don't do that. If we get too focused on, in this idea to be coming home to the Lord, if we get too, well, what do I have to do? What do I have to do? Give me a list, you know, show me what I've got to do so I can check it off. And then, and then invariably, once you check off that list, you're done. I mean, nobody, well, some OCD people might do this. Um, nobody has their to-do list for the day. And then after it's completed, they like put it in a file so that in a year they can look back and say, here's what I did on, you know, March 22nd, 2017. I mean, maybe some people do, but I'm talking, and I'm not talking about like, you know, uh, important things. I'm talking about the simple everyday things where you go, all right, I went to the grocery store. Here's what I bought. If you're hanging on to your grocery list from three years ago, just so you know what you bought, whatever, you're, you're probably a little nutty. Okay. A list is made so that you, once you cross it off, you can throw it away and move on to the next thing. That That's not what we're to do when it comes to our faith. We're not to go, all right, show me what I have to do to be reconciled to God so I can check it off my list. Too many people approach their faith like that. See, what, what St. Paul's talking about is this. It's not about doing things. It's about loving God more. And when you increase in your love of God, then, and, and in the knowledge of what that means and how that goes, then, then all of a sudden now it's like the lights go on and you can perceive what is really important. Because when you look at God in the context of a loving relationship, that's going to that's gonna dictate the things that have value. Now, you might think that that's hard to understand, but it's really not. Look at any relationship that you have in your life, okay? If you value, if, if you love your kids, that love is going to dictate what has value. So, for example, if I love my kids more than anybody, right, well, then obviously I'm going to spend more time with them than I do with, you know, my friends, okay? Do I love my friends more or do I love my kids more? right? Love dictates what has value. If I love my kids and I work hard and I only have, let's say, you know, I work Monday through Friday, uh, you know, 7 a.m. to 5 o'clock at night. So that leaves very little time to hang out with them because they got stuff going on or whatever. Or you're tired. But let's say Saturday or Sunday is your day to spend with your family, okay? The love that you have for them is going to show you what has uh, value, and then that will drive your, your actions. So you're not going to say, oh, man, we've got one day a week together without a bunch of other stuff going on. So I think that's the day 
where I'm going to go, um, you know, play golf for 16 hours a day and then come home and, uh, you know, spend some time in my workshop, right? That's not how that's going to work. If you love them, that love is going to show you that there's more value in spending time with them and investing in them than in yourself. Now, a lot of us get that messed up. You know, a lot of us get that backwards. I know I've done that many times, but really what that reveals isn't that we don't know the right thing. It's that we don't love enough. Okay. It's that our sense of love is, is out of whack sometimes, because when we look back on our lives and we see those instances, we can look back and go, man, I just didn't love them the way I should have. I loved myself more than others. But when, and when you love God more than anything, then you can see what is of value. And that's, what's going to make you pure and blameless. Why? Because you're going to avoid sin, not because you're trying to check a list, but because you love God. And that was God's point anyway. God didn't say to you, do this or else. That's not the ultimate message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is I love you and I've redeemed you and I want you to come into this loving relationship with me. So if you have this loving relationship with God, then of course you're going to to desire those things that God desires. And you're going to avoid those things that God uh, doesn't, doesn't approve of. But it's not out of a sense of, of fear or duty in some, in some degrees. That's, that's okay. But the better way, Scripture says, is love. Is love. So think about that with the context of what it means to return to come home. That this is the work of God. Now, as I mentioned, you know, you look at this text. I said earlier, this is the work of God. And I love what St. Paul says here when he says, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will co continue to complete it. Now, who is that? All right. Who is that? Who's the one who begins this good work? Is it you? No. No, it's not. Spoiler alert. You didn't begin the good work of God in you. God began the good work of God in you. Friends, welcome to Christianity. This is what the gospel is all about. That while we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive through Christ. This is the point. We didn't do this. God has done this. Well, then what's our job? Our job is to love God. That's our job. If you want to know that, the, I mean, that's what Jesus said, right? What are we supposed to do? What's the most important thing of all things? Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love God, you're going to do that. Okay? So, don't make it so complicated. We have to always remember this. We, we can sometimes turn this into some sort of difficult rocket science. Okay. It's really not. Now, just because it's not difficult, this is going to sound weird, but follow me on this. Doesn't mean that it's easy. Okay. Doesn't mean that it's easy because loving God, ultimately, I'll tell you this, loving God is hard sometimes, isn't it? Because to love God, you have to, you have to uh, basically die to yourself. That's what the scripture says. You have to take up your cross. So that's not an easy thing to do. It's really hard to not love yourself. And I know that there's a thing out there. Everyone's like, oh, I hate myself. I hate myself. I hate myself. I'm always very skeptical, by the way, when someone tells me how much they hate themselves, especially if they live in a house, drive a car, wear clothes, and eat food. Okay? If you really hated yourself, you wouldn't do any of those things. You wouldn't take care of yourself. You wouldn't satisfy the desires that yourself has. You wouldn't gratify that. The Bible says that if you walk by the flesh, you will gratify the desires of the flesh. But if you walk by the spirit, you won't. And that's the essence of loving God is to say, I desire God over self. And that is not an easy thing to do. It's simple in the fact that it's not a hard concept, but it's, it's very difficult in terms of the execution of it. That's why God has given us the sacraments. The sacraments work within us to transform us so that that process of sanctification, which basically is that essence of purification, turning us into saints, that is the result of the love of God working in and through us, transforming us. That's the good work that Paul's talking about here. And who began that? God began that. And that's what Advent is about. It's about God saying, I'm saving these guys by, by sending my son to do what they can't do for themselves. If, if you could do it yourself, you wouldn't need Jesus. And I guarantee you this, if, if Jesus didn't need to die on the cross, he probably wouldn't have, okay? Because I guarantee you that was a lot of pain. That was a lot of suffering. And Jesus said to the father in the garden, 
He said, if there's any other way, like take this cup from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That shows us, my friend, that this was the only way. And Jesus loves you enough that he was willing to do it. The question is, and, and look what that love accomplished. Will you love him back? That's the whole point of all of this, my friends. And those barriers, those mountains, those valleys that get in the way, God wants to say, boom, get out of the way. I'm lowering those mountains. I'm filling in those valleys. I am making making a path for you. Oh, I can't wait to get to the gospel. We got to jump into this gospel. It's powerful. Okay, alleluia, alleluia. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight his path. You know where this is going. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Alleluia, alleluia. Luke chapter three, verse one through six. We're seeing now where this is going to get tied in, in the gospel, what this is all about, how God's work is being done right here through this man, John the Baptist. Powerful stuff. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Tacronitus. And Licinius was tetrarch of Abilene. Probably said that wrong. Don't really care. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the desert. Now, we remember this from before in Luke, where, where he came to Zechariah, Gabriel, and said, and said uh, you're going to have a son. And Gabriel's like, I don't believe that. The word of God comes to the son of Zechariah in the desert. Now, of course, John the Baptist. John went throughout the whole region of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the desert, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Woo, look at this. Every valley shall be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. Sounds kind of like Baruch, doesn't it? The winding roads shall be made straight and the rough roads be made smooth and all flesh shall, shall see the salvation of God. Boom. This is God's plan, and it's getting ready to go down. It's like a divine throwdown against the devil, against sin. Here comes John the Baptist saying, I am here to make, make the pathway, to make straight the way of the Lord. This is being fulfilled, okay? This is being fulfilled in John the Baptist. Now, what does John the Baptist have to do with all this? He's the one crying out in the desert, get ready. He's the one saying to those captives, come home. And he's showing you how to do this. All right. So John the Baptist is saying, look, we've got to get ourselves right. And he's not saying by uh, keeping the law perfectly. He's saying you can't. So his message is repentance, repentance. That's his baptism. But but what is the key thing about John the Baptist? What does he do, my friends? John the Baptist shows us Jesus, doesn't he? He declares Jesus when Jesus is walking toward him. Now, remember, these guys were cousins. OK, they probably grew up. Together, they knew each other. They, they grew up within proximity of one another. They obviously knew each other. These weren't giant cities, okay, where you could not know your relatives. These were, these were small villages and towns. And yeah, Jesus was, was taken out of, a, you know, of town to go to Egypt for a season. But, you know, these guys are adults now. And John looks at Jesus. And I guarantee you, John was a Bible scholar, man. He knew his Old Testament. He knew... Genesis. He knew Isaiah. He knew all these things. He knew the promise that God himself would provide a lamb for the sacrifice. He understood what Passover was all about. And when Jesus comes walking toward him, he says, behold, the lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. We say that in our, in our liturgy every week. John, those are the words of John the Baptist, my friends. He said, I baptize you with repentance, but one is coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with fire and the Holy Spirit. He must increase. I must decrease. Let's do this. That's the message of John the Baptist. He points us to Jesus. He sets the stage by, by this ministry of repentance so that when Jesus comes, people's hearts are turned toward him. Friends, that's the idea. That's what it means to come home. John is calling the people of God back. And what's the way back? Repentance. Repentance. That's always the way back. Do you know that? If, if you find yourself far from God, you have to remember the way back is repentance. 
the, the way back is not, uh, you know, necessarily like a greater knowledge. The way back isn't trying to make up for it by doing stuff. If you don't really mean it. You know, we've all seen people who do that. The way back is a true repentant heart. And a repentant heart, yes, of course, repentance it leads to penance, of course. But it all begins in a heart that says, I've been going one way. Now I need to stop and go the other way. That's really the definition, ultimately, of the word repentance is to go the other way. And I think that's huge for us because the way back to Jesus requires that. Because why? Because we've sinned. Because we've fallen short. We've fallen away from him. And if we want to come home, we can do that. But, you know, I like the prodigal son, like that that story. What does it say happens to this, this young man as he's there in the slop of the pigs? It says, when he came to his senses. Okay, when he came to his senses, that's like a that's like an interior mindset shift that we're talking about, repentance. And that was like, I got to get out of here. I got to go back. Friends, that's ultimately the point. Now, returning doesn't mean that all of a sudden it happens, right? There's it can sometimes it can be a a a journey to get back. The prodigal son had gone far and he had to return and I would argue he had to persevere because it was probably a hard road to get back. It might not have been like an express Boom, I want to be there, therefore I'm there. Sometimes you have to work through to get back. But here's what you find when you get there is you find the father waiting for you. And not only that, the father, when he sees him, you know, I love this this imagery. The father runs to him. He runs to him. And this is a picture of Advent as well, because Jesus Christ ultimately is the father running to you. Did you know that? The father come down from heaven running to you in the person of the son, Jesus Christ. That's the idea, my friends. That's the idea. And this whole reading, this whole Sunday is about what God does to remove the obstacles on the journey. But we must still make the trip. So let's talk about our lives for a second. What obstacles stand in your way, my friend? Can you see your way back? For some people, they feel like I've gone so far. I don't even know how to get back. I don't know the way. Remember. God doesn't just show you the way, he is the way. Jesus is the way. So come to him, whatever things stand in the way, combat them with Jesus and you'll you'll get there. You can turn to him in an instant, my friend, and he will receive you. He doesn't put all these conditions in front of you. He doesn't put all of these things that you have to do, boxes you have to check. He just simply says, look, I've given you this incredible grace in the sacrament of confession where, that I mean, it's right there. Get there. But let's face it. Some of us have these mental blocks where we're just like, oh, I can't go do that. I talked to somebody a while ago, a long time ago, who had been away from the church for many, many years because some some horrible things had happened to her in the church. And, you know, we were trying to invite this person to come to church with us. And she was just like, I can't. I can't go to church ever again. You know, well, why? I just can't get past what's been done to me in the church, you know, and this wasn't Catholicism, but there was this internal struggle, this internal obstacle that seemed insurmountable to this person that they were just like, I can't make my way back there. And I think, you know, how many of us get hung up? How many of us have these barriers and these roadblocks? And I want to tell you this, I, I get it, but there's two things that you have to be if you want to do this. And of course, we saw this in our readings today. You have to be patient and you have to be confident, okay? Patience, because we have to remember that God knows the way, but it isn't always fast. Sometimes it takes a while before we step into that, right? And that's really up to us, isn't it? I mean, let's face it. The Israelites took 40 years to make an eight-day trip when they came out of Egypt to get to the promised land. If they just would have went straight, eight days to get there. How long did they wander around the desert? 40 years. Why? Because they weren't patient. They weren't patient. They weren't obedient. They weren't focused. They they were pulled back and forth by their love of self rather than their love of God. When they loved God, everything went great. God even guided them with a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke. God gave them the law. God gave them Moses. But what did they do? They complained. They made their own God because... They didn't have patience. They said, how long is he going to be up there? 
Aaron, make us a God. You know, we're scared of what's going on around us. We need a God to go before us in battle. You know, and they were, they were more concerned with themselves. They didn't, they didn't love God. You see, you got to have patience in this process. Too many people are so used to this instant gratification of because I want to get my life back with the Lord, that means it'll happen in, in one second. You know what, friends? Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't. And we have to be willing to be patient. We got to fight for it. You got to be willing to fight for your faith. Fight for your relationship with God. Okay, so we need patience. Secondly, we also need confidence. We need confidence. You know, that's what we're that's what we're called to have is, is confidence in this. Okay, my friends, because that's what St. Paul says. I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will, will continue to complete it. We have confidence not in ourselves, but we have confidence in God. Because even when we get lost, he'll move mountains to get to us. We got to have confidence. We can't be like, oh, I don't even know if it's worth it. You see, patience is about, can we do it? Confidence is about, is it worth it? And we've got to recognize that we need both and we can have both. So I'm asking you, my friends, where do you struggle the most in this situation? Do you struggle with having enough patience? Are you the kind of person that just like, oh, I want everything to happen right this second. And I don't know why I don't feel better, you know, or are you a person that struggles with confidence where you go, I don't even know if I can do it. Is it even worth it? We got to have both, my friends. And Advent is about that. Advent is about that. And I want to encourage each of you today, as you dig into this text, as you, as, as we read it, as we ask the Lord to work within us, to show us his truth and help us to hear what he would say to us, just say to God today, Lord, give me patience. I'm struggling. I, I know that I need to love you more. And I know I need to, to um, be joyful in that love and be reconciled to you, but I just struggle with it because I want everything to happen instantly. I want that restoration to happen right now. I want that, that uh, spirit of freedom to happen right now. I want that finished work to be finished right now. You know, I want that end process. I know you're going to be finished in me. I want it right, right now. But I struggle. If that's you, then bring that to the Lord. Bring that struggle to him. Say, God, everything I have is yours. Even my impatience, God, I'm bringing that to you this Advent season so that you can do the work in me that I can't do for myself. Now, let's talk about confidence briefly. If you struggle with confidence, okay, you have to recognize that God is the author and perfecter of our faith. And you may look at yourself and get burnt out and bummed out and feel like, oh, woe is me. Okay, quit doing that. Look at God. Whenever you have that moment where, and I think this is this is sort of a good um, antidote for for both for two things: for unhealthy shame, which I would say all health, all shame is unhealthy because shame is not about behavior; it's about identity. Um, and unhealthy pride. Okay, I don't think all pride is unhealthy if it's put in the right place. Okay, in in God. When, when you are feeling like you're a worthless scumbag that is unlovable and unworthy, that's when you have to put your focus on God and put your confidence on God. Say, God, you have, you have begun this good work in me. When you have too much confidence in yourself, right? Then you got to look at yourself and go, yeah, you got to examine yourself and go, yeah, you know, I see in myself a lot of things that need work, that need uh, repentance and that need the grace of God to transform within me. So confidence in God um, and humility will, will, will get you there. So if you're struggling with confidence in yourself, look towards Jesus and recognize that he's the one that is working this process. Your job, your job is simply this, to receive the love that he gives to you and to love him back. Now you go, that's all I have to do. Yeah. Well, that's where it starts. And that's what motivates everything that comes next. Because as we read before, what comes next is this, it's going to help you to know what's um, every kind of perception to discern what is a value so that you can be pure and blameless before the day of Christ. That's, that's what comes next, but it all comes through love, my friends. So I hope that you've enjoyed this time here with me in the scripture. I certainly have. I'm, I'm fired up about it. And um, if you know, Make sure you read through this a couple more times before you head to church this weekend and, and walk in 
ready to receive the teaching from your priest, you know, and, and hear what he has to say to you because God will be speaking through him. But now that we've done this together, your heart is primed and ready to listen, my friends. So keep your eyes on Jesus. Recognize what he's done for you, my friends. And if you need to return to him, come home. He's made the way for you. He is the way. God bless you, my friends. Take care. And I'll see you here next time on Unpacking the Mass.